Hello everyone, welcome to the infamous Sanger sequencing, which is one of the very first sequencing methods that has been introduced in the world and it is extremely accurate. It's still being used as a gold standard for DNA sequencing. So without further ado, let's dive in. So first of all, let's understand the basics of DNA sequencing. You have this entire DNA and you want to read the sequence of this entire DNA. Now, since often we have a very small amount of DNA as input, we sometimes want to clone it to make it more, to make it abundant. And then what we do is we fragment the DNA into small fragments, into small pieces. We do this because the sequencing techniques, most of them are incapable of reading the whole DNA from start to finish. Now, the main goal of the DNA sequencing is to actually read the string of these fragments. So you want to know what is there in this fragment. So, so is it like A, A, C, C, T, G or something like that? Also, what is there in this fragment? Maybe it is A, C, C, G, G, A, T, etc. Now, these are all randomized. So what we want to do is we want to use some computational method, some genome assembly method, some computer program to assemble these strings, to align these strings onto an ideal human reference genome. So we have aligned those. And now basically for each position, we simply take the consensus. So suppose we have four A's and one T or one C in this position. So this in this position, we are just going to put an A since majority of them are A. Similarly, suppose in this position, we have C, C, G, C, C. We are going to put C right here. That is how we are going to assemble the whole genome. Now, the main goal of sequencing is to do two things. How exactly we want to fragment this large long DNA. And number two, which is the main thing, how exactly are we going to read these fragments, the strings of these fragments? So that's what we are going to discuss for Sanger sequencing. So first of all, let's start with some basics that we need to know before we dive in inside the Sanger sequencing and its setting. So this is a double-stranded DNA. So DNA is double-stranded, which we all know. So this is, you can think of this as the forward strand, and you can think of this as the reverse strand, starting from here and ending right here. So in each strand, we have actually four kinds of bases, adenine, thiamine, cytosine, and guanine. A always binds with T, and C always binds with G. That is how these two strands actually remain attached with each other. Just to simplify things, if this is one of your strand, A, A, C, A, G, G, T, then this will be the complementary strand which will be attached because the complementary base of A is T and the complementary base of C is G. So that's very simple. Now let's look at a little bit more, a little bit more fine-grained. So how exactly this A or T looks like? So this is how it actually looks like. Now, I don't want to go too deep into the chemistry, but you need to know a little bit of it for this video to understand Sanger sequencing. So that is what I am going to give you right now. So first of all, as you can see that this guy right here, one, two, three, four, five, there are five carbons. There are five carbon atoms in this one. So this is called deoxyribose sugar. So this is called deoxy because one of the oxygen is missing. You can see that there is a hydrogen right here, but normally in RNA, in RNA, you have an oxygen as well. So there is OH, that oxygen is missing. That is why it's called deoxyribose sugar. Now, these different carbons have different things on them. For example, in carbon number one, you have the N base. You have the nitrogenous base. And this is what determines whether your nucleotide or your base is A, T, C, or G. So for A, there is a certain structure. For C, there is a certain nitrogenous structure and so on and so forth. You get my point. So this whole part right here on the right is actually the same. It's the same for A, T, C, and G. A, T, C, and G. The only difference is the N base. So this is where the difference is made. So I think this is clear. Now, in the five end, we have this triphosphate. So there are these phosphorus atoms right here. Okay, fine. And this whole thing is called DNTP. Okay, so for A, it will be DATP. T is DTTP. Then DCTP and DGTP. There is another concept which is called dideoxyribonucleoside triphosphate. So there is this extra dye here. That means two oxygens are actually getting rid of. So you can see that there is no oxygen right here, right? So two oxygens are gone. That is why di oxy. Now this is called DDNTP. So if this nitrogenous base is A, the one for adenine, then it is going to be called DDATP. 
if it is for guanine then it is going to be dd gtp and so on and so forth so now in the next slide we are going to see how these two structures actually come into play how i mean why exactly did i, did I cover this in this tutorial so first of all some more basics so you need to learn some basics for this tutorial i mean you will understand much of sanger sequencing i know some videos are out there where they just start the sanger sequencing right away but i, I don't think it, it works that way so suppose this is the forward strand or this is one strand of the dna so if you want to synthesize or if you want to make dna you can actually make dna and you need the dna polymerase enzyme in order to do this now in order for the dna polymerase enzyme to make the complementary strand you need to have a certain small sequence called primer as the starting point so i'm just giving you an example here suppose tgg is the starting point for the dna polymerase so when dna polymerase sees this kind of starting sequence small sequence it starts the synthesis process so in place of g it will create c then in place of t it will create a and so on and so forth so how it exactly looks like is like this so you can see that in place of a as the complementary t is being attached now what is really happening is the molecule or the base I mean the TNTP that is before, so it is DCTP that is before. There is a OH right there, so we already saw that in the previous slide. There is an OH, so this OH is attached to the phosphate group of the next DNTP, which, which in this case is DDTP. So these two things will be attached, and thus this strand will actually keep growing, right? So you can imagine that in the next step, a G will appear here, a G will appear here. The phosphate group of that G, of that DGTP, will attach to the OH group of this DDTP, right? So that is how the DNA strand will keep growing. So DNA polymerase will keep synthesizing until the end of the single strand, right? But here is the main interesting thing. Suppose instead of supplying a DNTP, you supply a DDNTP. So you know that in the DDNTP, there is no such thing as OH, right? Because both the oxygens are gone. So if there is no OH group, then it cannot really attach with a new phosphate group, right? So the DNA can no longer be synthesized. It stops right here. So these two fundamental concepts are the ones used for Sanger sequencing. So hopefully you've understood so far. Okay. Now I'm going to actually talk about the setup, the whole Sanger sequencing. So you have the whole genome right here. So there is something called restriction enzyme right here. So what is restriction enzyme? So it is one kind of bacterial enzyme that recognizes small sequences in the DNA and it cuts those sequences like scissors. So this restriction enzyme is cutting this DNA in these two regions. And so we are going to get this fragment, double stranded fragment out. Now this is, this is something which is also used in genome editing. I'm going to give you the link in the description for genome editing so you can actually understand more. If you want to understand more how this restriction enzyme works, you can watch that video. I'll give the link in the description. So typically these strands, these fragments are less than 700 base pair. If you denature and heat them up, it will become a single strand. So one of the strands will go away. And you need to amplify it. You need to clone it multiple times. So there is something called PCR or polymerase chain reaction. I'll probably make a separate video on this later on. So if you apply the PCR amplification process, so you are going to be able to clone a single strand of the DNA fragment multiple times, so many, many times. So the more you run the PCR cycle, you are going to have more of these same strand being copied. Okay. So here I have just shown you like five copies. In reality, you are going to create like millions of copies or thousands of copies. This is a tube. So in this tube, we are going to put all these clones together. We are going to put the primer because primer is needed for synthesis. The obviously DNA polymerase is the go-to guy. You are going to put the DNTPs, that means the A, T, C, and G, and it will be in high concentration. And you are also going to put in the DDNTPs, that means DDA, DD, T, DDC, and DDG, right? So these DDNTPs will be actually colored. They will be colored with fluorescent molecules. So I'm just assuming that these four colors are being used for A, T, G, and C. Now, I'm pretty sure that you have two questions right now. Number one is, why are we giving DNTP in high concentration? And why are we giving TDNTP in low concentration? That is number one. And number two is why exactly are we using colors in only DDNTP? Why don't we use color in TNTP as well? So now I'm going to answer both of those questions with an example. So first of all, suppose that this is our DNA strand. So this is the strand we are trying to clone here. We are cloning here. Obviously, this is only 15 base pair. 
I mean, normally it is much longer, but this is just for an example. So if we put this in the tube and there is primer, DNA polymerase, these things. So DNA polymerase will start synthesizing. So this is DNTP. This is another DNTP. Now, obviously there is also DDNTPs in the tube. So one of the DDNTPs, which is the DDATP, will join right here. Now we know that whenever DDNTP joins, the strand synthesis is over. You can no longer synthesize the strand. So it is over right here and it is also colored. So we know, I mean, we can detect that there is some kind of yellow color flashing out. If you can somehow know that this yellow color has flashed out in the third position, then we can know that the complementary of A, the is T, is actually the third base of the data strand. Let me give an another example. I mean, we know that there are many copies of this strand. So this is another copy. So also there was synthesis going on here. I mean, these are all DNTPs and suddenly our DDNTP comes by because also we have DDNTP here in low concentration. So suddenly the G appears here and the synthesis process disrupts. If we can somehow understand that this is the sixth position, then we can get from the green color that this should be C, right? So you actually now know why exactly are we using low concentration because we don't want to try to terminate the synthesis process even before starting. We want some, I mean, some randomness here. We want, to, we want the DDNTP to come randomly and stop the synthesis process so that we can get the position. And the color is used in DDNTP because that is the marker that we're using here. So this is another case where DDNTP came first and halted the process. So the first position is T and we can keep on looking at these things. Okay. Now the main question that we want to answer right now is how do we get the exact position of the synthesis termination? So I've assumed that, okay, somehow we can detect the yellow color and somehow we can know that it is in the third position, but how can we know that? That is the question that I will answer right now. So this is the setup. Let me discuss this setup very quickly. So this is gel. So you can think of this as some kind of gel. And if you leave all the synthesized strands, you saw in previous slide that we had many DNA strands synthesized using the DNA polymerase. So if you can just pour those strands on this gel. So, so this is the starting position of the gel. So we don't put any voltage right here. Normally these molecules are very slightly negatively charged and we can put some high voltage right here. So we can, we can like use some battery or something like that to put some high voltage. So there is a voltage difference and there will be a pull towards downwards. So there will be, there will be a downward pull. So there is a special property of this gel. So if you have a longer DNA strand right here, it will take more time for this strand to reach the bottom compared to the shorter ones. And this is very important. Even if your DNA strand is only one base shorter, it would still reach the bottom significantly faster compared to the one which is one base longer okay so that is why you see this nice structure where the single base synthesized strand is actually here at the beginning and then gradually the next ones will appear right now you can clearly understand that if we can somehow put a camera and laser to detect the color then we can easily verify you can easily know that first we will get a blue then another blue then another yellow then another green and so on and so forth and if we know those colors we know what bases are those and we can simply take the complementary of those and we are going to get the main sequence so this will be a a t c g c g a t t and so on and so forth you get the idea now this whole setup is called capillary electrophoresis because this whole tube that I'm showing you, which is a very fat tube, is not really fat. It's a very slim tube and it's well segmented so that these, uh, this laser can work very well. That's the thing. So yeah, this is basically the Sanger sequencing. Now, obviously there is another question that you, can, that you may have in your mind, which is a very valid question. That is, suppose we have the same same synthesized strand three times. It can happen, right? Because I mean, the termination process is random. So maybe we are going to terminate at the same position multiple times. And that is okay. Then what will happen is these three strands of the same length will appear at the bottom at the same time. This is even better because then we are going to have three A's, three yellow markers. So there will be a very high yellow line, which will be even easier to detect. So if we have more than one strand, uh, this is even better for us for of the same size. Okay. That is the thing. So what are some important characteristics of Sanger sequencing? The first one is it is highly, highly accurate. The accuracy is, you can see, mind boggling. So this is gold standard for DNA based coding. So why I'm saying this is because like if you're developing some new technique and you want to verify it, you should use Sanger sequencing to know the exact basis. Now, I think you already know why this is extremely slow because 
in one tube or in one electrophoresis, capillary electrophoresis tube, we can only insert one single fragment, right? So we saw that, I mean, using that digestion enzyme, we could get only a small fragment of the DNA, which is less than 700 base pair. And we had to copy it multiple times. And so far, what we have discussed is how we can, how exactly we are going to read that single DNA strand. And there are millions and millions of DNA strand, and we need to read all of them. So it is extremely slow, and it can take years to sequence the DNA. And that is why it is extremely costly as well and takes billions of dollars to sequence the entire human genome. Compare it with something like Illumina sequencing, which is a next generation sequencing people use nowadays. It costs only like $500 to sequence an entire human genome with, I mean, okay quality. Now, st still, it is used a lot because suppose you have a new sequencing technique and you want to verify its sequencing accuracy. So you can use that technique on some short regions of DNA and you can sort of also sequence that short region of DNA using Sanger sequencing. And so that can be used as a gold standard, right? And also what sometimes happen, happens is in some sample, you want to study a single small gene and you want to study the change of that gene for finding some special characteristic. So since a single gene is like 1000 kilobase pair, I mean, 1,000 base pair or 3,000 base pair or something like that, you can very easily use Sanger sequencing to get an accurate estimation of what that gene looks like. So that is all about Sanger sequencing. So hopefully, you are going to like the video. So if you like the video, feel free to share and subscribe. So there is a donation link in the description. So feel free to make some donations to support our channel so that we can make more great videos like this one. Thanks very much.